love that song. Thank you, Brother Keith, for sharing that with us tonight. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. We're going to look at the story tonight of where the Roman centurion came to Jesus and was asking him to come and to bring healing to his house. Very familiar story. And tonight we'll look at the centurion and look at at his attitude and how he came to the Lord. Matthew chapter 8, we'll start reading in verse 5 and we'll read down through verse 13. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. The centurion was a Gentile, and they were looked at as outcasts among the Jews. Of course, the Romans had much disdain for the Jewish people as well. And so the very, the very thought and the act that this would even take place, that this Roman centurion and that this Jewish rabbi would have this conversation conversation, and that th- this would happen goes against the customs of their day. Yet the Bible says that this centurion comes to Jesus and when he approaches him, the Bible says that he beseeches him. Now beseech is not something that we use in our English language today, but The word beseech means to strongly appeal to or to beg or to ask intently. The Apostle Paul used this same word in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 when he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It is a strong appeal to beg someone to ask intently. So the Bible said that this centurion came to Jesus as a Jewish rabbi and he was begging him. He was asking him very intently for him to come and to heal this servant that he had. He had a desire in his heart for Jesus to do a great work for him. We have to ask ourselves the question, do we have a desire for God to do a work in our life, in our personal lives, in our homes, and in our churches? I really believe that we're living in a day and age where uh, we as Christians have lost a desire for God to do a great work. Now, we want God busy in our life. We, we pray for God to be involved and busy in our daily life. But are we praying for and expecting God to do something great? For God to do something above and beyond the ordinary and the normal? We know that we have a promise from God's Word that He is going to meet our physical needs. Yet, we pray constantly for God to do that. We ask God to do those things within our daily lives, but do we pray and do we desire for a great work? We have as much God in our life as we want. Think about that for a moment. Let that sink in. That we have as much God in our life as we want. The other day I was thinking about growing up and and, in the church that we grew up in, 
even though we were in town, a lot of people would call it the old country church. We grew up in a church where uh, the, the people loved to praise the Lord. The spirit was thick. Uh, people would, would get up and, and walk and run the aisles. The, the ladies of the church would shout and, and, and just, you know, you just saw a moving of the Holy Spirit. You could, there are times I can remember revival meetings that the Spirit of God would come in such a way that the Spirit was so thick you could cut it with a knife. And this thought came to me the other day that we have a whole generation of young Christians who have never seen that kind of movement of God ever in their life. They don't even know what that's like. They've never even seen it. They've never experienced it. They, you know, they understand that God is with them on a daily basis and that God speaks to them and walks with them and those, those things. But to really see a great work of God, to see that, 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 the, the movement of God in such a great way that they've never experienced that. You find in in verse 13, the very last verse there, uh, Jesus, as he is talking to the centurion, he says, it's going to happen to you as you have believed. And I've said this in many sermons, that the Lord was putting it back on him. It said, it's not that I have the power. Jesus knew that he had the power. He said, but the question here is, do you have faith that I have the power? It's how much you believe. It is the faith that you have that is going to determine what happens in this situation. And this wasn't the only situation where Jesus said that to others. It wasn't a question of whether or not Jesus was able to heal or if Jesus was able to meet the need or to answer the prayer. That is not in question. In fact, the Bible says there is nothing that is impossible with God. Amen? The question is, do we have the faith to believe that God is able to do the great work that we desire in our heart? If we as individual Christians and collectively as a body of Christ desired for God to do something great, for there to be a great movement of God, for there to be a great revival, for there to be some great miracle that God would work in our midst, I really believe that it's based on our faith in God. It's not based on whether He can do it. Certainly He can do it. But do we have the faith to believe that He is able to do it? When the centurion came to Jesus and said, uh, you know, my, my servant is, is grievously tormented. He, my servant is very sick. And he realized that Jesus was his only hope. And he came to him and the Bible said he begged him. He, he sought him intently to do this thing for him. And Jesus' answer to him was this. Be it done as you believe. If you've got the faith, you're going to see what can happen. And the Bible said that in that same hour, the servant was healed. One of the first things I want you to see tonight is in verse 8, and I want you to notice the humbleness of this centurion. The Bible said the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Again, this centurion being a Gentile, the Gentiles thought that they were a superior race, especially above the Jewish people. For him to be a centurion, a man of authority, a man of rank, a man that has paid his dues and has risen through the ranks of the Roman army, he has a tremendous amount of power. There could be a a huge ego that could go with that. And yet he comes to a Jewish rabbi and says, I am not worthy for you to even come to my house. If you will just simply speak the words, my servant will be healed. He realized that he had done nothing to deserve the Lord Jesus to do a great work in his life. He realized that even though he was this man, this great man in everybody else's eyes, that really he was nothing. He may have had power over other men, but he did not have power over the sickness that had afflicted his servant. And he realized that he needed help from somewhere else. And he comes and he says, I am not even worthy. And I'll tell you tonight, we're not worthy of any of the work that God would do in our lives tonight. None of us have said, done, been anything. In fact, the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. None of us deserves for God to do a great work in our life. And yet we should have the desire and that we should beseech the Lord, that we would plead with Him and beg with Him that He would do that great work in our life. 
You know, you see people today, you know, a lot of people have, I think, issues with pride and, and arrogance and those kind of things. But I read a story uh, a number of years ago about Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong, of, of course, being one of the, the, uh, the pioneers of, of uh, traveling to outer space and, and those kind of things. I guess one of the things that he is most noted for was that while he was in space, he stuck up his thumb and he said he covered the entire earth with his thumb. And at that moment, he realized how small we really are. That from that distance in space, he could take his thumb and block out the entire earth. Neil Armstrong one time was standing on the southern steps of the temple the old, uh, there in, in Jerusalem, standing there on the southern steps. The stu- southern steps are authentic steps from the time of the temple, the steps that Jesus and the disciples would have used to go uh, into the temple. Those of you that have gone on our trips over there, you know that feeling. I would say it's probably one of the most spiritual feelings I've ever had, uh, maybe only second to the, to the garden tomb. But standing there on those steps and knowing that you're standing in the place where Jesus and the disciples walked on these very steps was just amazing. But Neil Armstrong, a man who is a pioneer of space travel and and all of these things, standing there on those southern steps, uttered these words. He said, I have never been more excited in my life than I am at this moment. A man who has been to outer space And yet, he said, I've never been more excited than to be standing where I'm standing at this very moment. His humbleness. To realize just how small and powerless that he really is. A man who could go into outer space. You know, we think of this vast earth and we think that we're something. And yet, Neil Armstrong covered it up with his thumb. And we realize just how small and insignificant that we are. I see the humbleness of this centurion that he comes before the Lord and we are taught in the scripture that we are to come humbly. We have a spiritual boldness to come to God but to come without our pride and to come without our arrogance to God and pray and expect God to do something for us. Those of you that ever listened to some of the older gospel, the the older quartets and things, the Blackwood Brothers Quartet had a had a big, tall, booming uh, bass singer a number of years ago by the name of John Hall. And John Hall sang that beautiful song, How Big Is God? And he talked about the sky is but a portion of his yard, and the clouds are nothing but his stepping stones. When you think about how big our God is and how small we are, you see the humbleness of this centurion. He came to Jesus Christ and he said, I am not even worthy to come in, that you would come into my house if you will just speak the words. Often we come to God with pride and arrogance in our heart. We come to God expecting Him somehow that He owes us something. That God has to answer this prayer because of something that we have done for Him. My friend, if you want to see God start moving in your life, then adopt a spirit of humbleness and realize that you and I are nothing. When you think about the vastness and the greatness of God, that we're nothing. In fact, the Bible says we're worms. I can remember as a teenager reading that in the scripture and thought, man, you talk about taking a knock to your self-esteem when the scripture says that we are nothing but worms and yet God loved us enough as we uh, was preaching this morning that he would send his son to die for a bunch of worms. But to come to God in humbleness of mind, humbleness of spirit, we look at his authority tonight. Notice what the centurion says. In verse 9, he says, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth unto another, Come, and he cometh unto my servant, Do this and to do that. The centurion is, is, is drawing the comparison here. He said, I understand what authority is. I I myself am under authority to those that are of a higher rank than me. But he said, I have authority over those who are under me. And I can order them to go here and they'll go. I tell them to go over here and do that and they will go. He said, I understand all of that. And what he realized is that Jesus had authority over whatever this sickness was that his servant had. 
The power that he possessed over others, he realized that Jesus had power and authority over whatever it was that was tormenting his servant. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus said himself that he has all power in heaven and in earth. Do we think about that when we pray? Do we let that ring in our hearts? Do we really uh, you know, keep in our mind that we're talking to someone who has declared and said that he has all power and that he has all authority? I've used the illustration. People say, well, what's the difference between power and authority? Well, you know, if you go in here in town and you don't stop at a stop, stop sign and you get those little blue lights behind you, does that officer have the authority to pull you over? Does he? Absolutely. Does he have the power? No. I mean, you could stand up there in front of it. He could stand up there in front of you, in, in front of your car, and you could run him over, right? Your car is more powerful than he is, but he has the authority to pull you over. Jesus not only has the power, but he has the authority. He has them both. And he says, I have all power and I have all authority. And he had the authority to meet the need that this centurion's servant had. Tonight, whatever you're facing in life, whatever you're going through at this moment, I want you to understand that the Lord Jesus has the power and the authority. He has the ability to take care of whatever the need is in your life. When Lazarus died and was in the tomb, and he came there, and, and Mary and Martha was, you know, Lord, if you had come earlier, you know, you might have been able to spare Lazarus. And Jesus said, where is the grave? And they took him there, and they said, roll away the stone. Oh, oh Lord, we, we shouldn't do that. He's been in there for four days. He's going to really smell bad. You know, the body's decomposing. And, 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 and he says, move the stone. And Jesus speaks life into that, that tomb, that grave. And the Bible said that Lazarus came forth. Why? Because he has all power and he has all authority. No one else can do that. He has power in your life. He has authority in your life. He has the right to tell me what to do because he has authority over my life. He has the right to tell you what to do. He has the right to decide what is best for us. There are times when the Lord will answer your prayer in the affirmative. There are times when he will answer your prayer in the negative. Why? Because he has the authority to say so. When you look at this story tonight, this great powerful centurion humbles himself before a Jewish rabbi, which would have been unheard of. And he said, and I, I beg you, I plead with you to do whatever it takes to heal this servant of mine. He obviously was very close to this servant. You know, he, he may have served him for years. And, and as we were talking earlier, it was probably more like family than it was a servant. And this centurion says, I, I beseech you, I beg you, do what you do and heal my servant. And I believe that I'm not, you're, you know, I'm not even worthy for you to come to my house. I believe you could just speak these words here and it will happen. And the Bible says that Jesus turns away from the centurion and speaks to the other people who are following him and says, I have not found this kind of faith anywhere in the place of Israel. Here is a man who is looked at by the Jewish people as, as you know, an outcast, uh, just a, a spiritual uh, bankrupt individual. And Jesus looks and says, I have not found this kind of faith in any of God's chosen people, of the people of Israel. God's looking for people to believe in what he is able to do, what he can do. And he has the power and the authority to do it. I've been sharing with you over the last few weeks about the revival that's taking place up in East Tennessee, there in Greenville, in our hometown. They've dubbed it the Greenville Awakening. And this was a revival that started in one of our small Free Will Baptist churches, tucked out at the foot of the mountain uh, there in Greenville, with the Greystone Free Will Baptist Church. This guy comes in and they and they they have revival and and uh, through that week and, and into the next week, it's just it, it gets to the point where there's standing room only. 
people are being saved almost every night. They realize the church is no longer big enough to, to, to hold the crowd. And, and someone provided this evangelist with a, a humongous tent. They found a place to set it up. And this has been going on since April the 15th. Since April the 15th, they've been having this revival. And now, Monday through Friday, hundreds if not thousands of people come every night. People are being saved and there are up to over 700 people who have been saved in this revival. And it's just, and they've, they've got it planned to go on, I think, now through November to go on. And, and, and people are being saved and people are being baptized. When I think about that kind of a revival happening, I have to repent and I have to ask God to forgive me because I have said in the past that I never thought we'd ever see something like that in my lifetime ever again. That I never thought you could see that kind of a revival. I've never heard of it in my life, in my, in my day and time. I've never heard of, of a revival like that that would go on for months at a time and over 700 people be saved. Maybe you have, but I've not. It's almost, uh, you know, reminds you of the great revivals that took place in England and, and up in the Northeast and stuff many, many years ago. But here's the key. Jesus said it's as you believe is what's going to happen. If we don't believe, we're not going to see a great work of God. If we don't have a desire for it, God's not going to force it on us. God's not going to make us uh, experience a great move of God. He wants us to have a desire. The centurion had a desire for the Lord to do something big, for the Lord to do something great, to do something beyond his ability. We've got to want to, uh, to have the desire for it. But then we've got to have the faith to believe that God is able to accomplish it. I believe we should pray for things that in our spirit, in our heart, we believe are impossible. Do you ever pray for the impossible? Do you ever pray for something and the devil comes and starts pecking on your shoulder and says, that's not possible, that can't happen, that will never happen? You're praying and you're asking God for something and the devil says, that can't happen. That'll never happen. That's the way I think God wants us to pray. God wants us to believe. He wants us to desire and to pray for big things. And God used that as an example to everybody else and said, I have not seen this kind of faith anywhere else in the land of Israel or among the people of Israel. I believe that we have as much God in our life and in our churches as we want. I think it is directly related to the desires of our heart. And the more that we desire, the more that we earnestly pray for, the more work of God we will see happen in our midst. Whether that be in me personally, you personally, or we see it collectively as a church, the more desire we have, I think the more we will see God working. Tonight as I close this out, I want us to do this tonight. I want to ask you if you would come and join uh, others around the altar tonight that we would pray for God to do a great work in this place. That you would come and that you, and don't pray it if you don't mean it. Don't come and start telling God things you don't mean. But do you want God to do a great work in your life and in your family? And if you do, would you come and pray that? If you want God to do a great work in this church, would you come and pray that tonight? Would you ask God? And listen, and when the devil starts pecking on your shoulder and saying, that's impossible, then you'll know that you're praying the right thing. Because we need to pray for the things that the devil tells us are impossible. Jesus said in verse 13, it's according to what you believe as to what's going to happen. That's a challenge issued directly to us, whether or not we believe what we say we believe about our Heavenly Father. Would you join with me tonight in prayer, right now? Would you come? And again, don't pray a prayer you don't believe. Don't pray for something you don't desire. But friend, if you do desire it, if you do believe it, would you come and would you pray with us tonight?